Yeah. So what are you guys working on right now? Are you guys working on anything new? Any new releases coming up or anything? Let's talk about the show, maybe. I yeah, mean, that's we uh, that's our primary. We, we thing. got into a bad van accident. Uh, what five, six months ago? Six now, months five, ago. Six, six months ago, we were on tour. We were heading out to North Carolina for the first show of a forty-six or forty-two day tour. Yeah, something like that. And uh, we we spun out basically back tire blue, and we spun out, and the van rolled four or five times. So we've been out of commission for. Five six months, months, six yeah. months, and we have uh, not this Saturday, but next Saturday, our first show, our comeback show at the Slide Bar in Fullerton. So Very we've cool. been we've been focusing the last I don't know three weeks on playing music again, just yeah. fucking getting back in the vibe and the groove of playing as a band. We so, got a couple yeah. bands on there that you know actually we got Bear Wolf, which uh, I see on the on the wall over there. Yeah, Bear they must have played Bear with Wolf you guys in. before. Yeah, I think he did like episode five of this one. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Right. So we got them. We got Laced in Blue, which is a bluesy. Bluesy sort of band, girl frontage. She's got a bit of a also from Long Beach. thing yeah. kind of going on. Yeah. And then we got our friends Joyce Wolf, of course, who are running back from this this tour. They just played with Slash, I think, tonight. Playing with Slash, and they're running back from this tour across U.S. and uh, getting back to play this one with us, which is a great, great thing because yeah. they're, they're our best friends. Yeah. Yep. Are you guys comfortable talking about the event that happened, the yeah. crash? Yeah, yeah that's totally. Fine. Yeah, totally. Okay, because I think a lot of people are curious about it, you mm -hmm. know, how, how it happened, and obviously your tire blew out, your back tire, and you spun yeah, out. Yeah, I was I was driving. That's Luke was driving, and uh, it, I was, was, it was regular. It was fine. It was like all smooth sailing. Jake was sleeping in the back. We'd like built a bed in the back, and Herbie was sitting up in the passenger seat, and Juan was also sleeping in the middle bench of the van. And we were just cruising along, all good. And then, boom, the the back tire popped. And for the first few seconds, it was all good. And I think like every <laughs> exactly, we heard the 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 rumble of the tire against the the concrete. But everybody kind of woke up and started to realize, oh shit, something's happening. And I took my foot off the acceler accelerator and just kind of let it glide for a minute. And then um, we hit a, a pothole. The road was pretty fucking shitty out there, Oklahoma on the I forty. And we hit a pothole, and then. It's like the wheel just fucking turned hard left and it locked hard left and I had no ability to control it anymore and the van just spun out. The trailer flipped out. Luckily, we didn't hit any other cars, so it was a single car accident, but we rolled three or four times on the fucking the concrete and then flew over the, the metal barrier and fell 10, 15 feet into a grass ditch below and then shit they had to come and to pull jake out they had to cut him out with the jaws of life and yep. buzz saw that buzz buzz saw saw was like right next to my head i was like after i, I realized that every they they luke cut himself free with uh he, he grabbed a knife out of the back seat and cut his seat belt off and herbie and him climbed out and they found juan off in the off in the paddock about 30 feet away because he'd been ejected while it was flipping which is in itself, a miracle that he survived. Out of the and, car? Yeah. 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 In the middle, middle, middle of the flip. I was inside a sleeping bag, and in one of the flips, I got shot out of the sleeping bag Holy through the window, yeah. 30 feet up in the air, and landed... Far, far away. Hey, but yeah. what, he, what he said, though, afterwards, it was the softest piece of grass in the whole planet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, I, I was in heaven. Yeah, I was in heaven for that moment. So then, uh, yeah, Luke, Luke came back to me, and I, I was still trapped in the in the wreckage. It was like a... I was, like, upside down with my face against the dirt, and my foot was on backwards. I definitely knew that I had broken my leg. Could you and could you feel the pain yet, or was you were in shock? And you I wasn't really, was it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't so much a painful as it was very, very uncomfortable, the position I was in with the leg backwards and everything. And I was more, I was groaning a lot. There's no question about that. And then, uh, yeah, they finally got, they, they told me that everyone was okay, and uh, uh, the guys, the, the fire department finally came, and they start getting the buzz saw out. And after I'm like screaming out for everyone being okay or whatever, then I'm starting to scream out, don't cut my fucking face. Yeah. Cause this buzz saw, like I'm seeing the thing like right next to my head buzzing in to, to cut me free from this thing. That was definitely one of the, the scarier moments of it. Oh man. Yeah. And they finally, they finally get me out of there and, uh, they're like, Oh, can you, can you move your foot? Can you wiggle your toes? And my foot's like, limp gumby foot and the oh foot's God. like literally on backwards and i'm still able to wiggle my toes so like that's a that's a real good sign that's a real good sign come to find out that after they they got me into the ambulance they come up to my brother and they're like hey 
Uh, don't worry, don't worry. Your brother Jake's gonna be fine. He's gonna lose his leg, but he's gonna be fine. It looks Holy like he's shit. gonna what? I'm like, he's that's gonna not what? that's not my definition of fine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that right. is not okay. And we, we come to find out even after that that uh, the fire department, when they saw what the wreckage looked like down the down the little hill that we fell down or whatever, that they'd started walking over to the van with the body bags already out. Yeah. They Damn. expected that we were all dead. Yeah. Yeah. They were, they literally, uh, the fire, the fireman I talked to was like, we literally saw it and we were just there for retrieval. Yep. That's it. The, the whole thing though, I Clean mean, up. B- Clean besides, up besides the initial accident, it was really just a series of miracles that happened afterwards mm-hmm. because first of all, after it happened immediately, the whole line of traffic behind us came to a standstill. Everybody got out of their cars they ran down. We had people helping us out before the fire department even yeah. got there. Yeah, imagine that fucking people. Imagine yeah. that happening in LA. Imagine the four or five would not happen. It would never, it would happen. never no happen. No fucking chance. They just go around you. Yeah, because yeah. 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 they were late for work. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. yeah they're on their way somewhere. It doesn't even on have their to be work. Their yeah, next audition. Or Wherever whatever. it is. And so that happened, and we got so much support and help from people, even within the first, you know, first responders of 10, 15 minutes. But then after that, once the fire department got there. One of the firefighters, once they, they carted my brother away, and uh, they carted Juan away, too, because he, he obviously suffered a concussion and a broken collarbone from the ejection. So those two had been taken away in ambulances. And uh, they one of the firefighters asked me, do you guys know anybody around here? And I'm like, dude, I don't, we don't know anybody for 500 miles. We don't know anybody until the other, to the other side of Arkansas. And he's like, let me make a phone call. And so he called up his mom, who's a musician in the area. And she was sound asleep from a gig the night before. Got out of got out, hung over his shit, got out of bed, called all of her fucking musician friends, rallied a whole group of people. They brought fucking four cars all to grab all of our gear. It was on the side of the road. Strewn across the grass. Picked up Herbie, drove Herbie back to the house, housed our gear, housed us. For the better half of the next two weeks, whilst uh, obviously Jake, my brother, was fucking getting carted, and I thought he was about to lose his legs, so I got no way to get there. We're in the middle of bumfuck nowhere, okay? So there's no Ubers, there's no taxis. I put up my thumb, and I hitchhike all the way to Oklahoma City. This is about an hour and a half. This is immediately after the Immediately accident. after. Yeah. Once, once, the gear, once the gear had been secured by this lady, this uh, firefighter's mom, I was like, okay, I got to go to my brother. I can't go back to her house. I can't go just relax right now. I got to yeah, go course. see my brother. Yeah. And so I put my thumb up. I hitchhike. This guy picks me up. He sees the accident, picks me up, takes me completely out of his way, drives me an hour and a half. Like a full U-turn job. Yeah, full U-turn, drives me out of the kindness of his heart of an hour and a half into Oklahoma City. So I make it there. Once we get there, we find out that it's the day of the Oklahoma City Marathon. So all the streets are completely closed down. He can't fucking drop me off out front of the hospital. So he drops me off as close as he can. I've got like two bags on each arm. I got Jake's laptop in my my arm too because we couldn't fit all the shit in the cars. And it's like 105 degrees out. So I'm basically joining in in this marathon in a race against time to make it to the hospital to try and see my brother before he goes into surgery. Sweating my ass off. Tears tears all across my face. Fucking blood, sweat, tears, literally. And I just collapse at some point. And a cop comes up to me and sees that I... He probably thought that I stole all that shit, honestly, in the state that I was looking. (laughs) Probably thought I stole all of that shit and asked me what the fuck was going on. And so I told him, like, I explained to him very briefly and distraught that uh, my brother's about to lose his leg potentially in the hospital. So he fucking puts me in his police car, turns the sirens on, moves all the roadblocks out of the way, and drops me out front of the hospital. I get in there, I get to see my brother 15 minutes before he goes into surgery. That's yeah. beautiful. It that was, was a story. Uh, it was, and he, he, came, he came and bawling his eyes out. I've never seen him so distraught before. And I just grabbed him by his neck and I said, dude, it's, it's okay. I'm, I'm okay. And it was like such a huge wash of relief that yeah. I, I've never seen like in anywhere. Wash came over his face and he was just like, like I don't know, like a, like a survivor on, on an island seeing a boat for the first time and getting brought aboard or something like that it was it was pretty pretty wild and then yeah i went went into surgery in oklahoma and they put a adamantium rod <laughs> into my leg <laughs> and uh and now i'm i'm pretty good after a little bit closer to being wolverine yeah mm-hmm. a little bit closer to wolverine I conv- seriously i convinced my girlfriend that it was uh, that i had to actually go back to oklahoma for another surgery because 
the type of metal that they put into me was adamantium and it, it doesn't it doesn't get uh, dealt with in anywhere in LA. Only in Oklahoma do they yeah. have the adamantium. Exactly. Necess- the amount of adamantium necessary to yeah. complete the surgery. Yeah, or unobtainium or whatever that now. <laughs> no, that's Avatar. Yeah, that's yeah. Avatar. That's Avatar. Unobtainium. So you got the surgery. Got the surgery and uh, then I was <laughs> I was in the the hospital drugged up with a real bad situation for a leg for about four or five days uh it's been broken in i think four different places and then once they they finally cleared me to get out of there there was no way i was allowed to fly so i had to stay in a oklahoma el cheapo motel or whatever for another week uh luke and his girlfriend and my girlfriend we all crashed in there for about a week and uh finally was cleared to fly back home and everyone's always like oh God, I'm so sorry that that happened to you, and oh, that's just the, the, such bad luck and all this kind of stuff. And yeah, it's a real damn shame that it happened. But as far as bad luck, we don't look at it like that. It was like literally the luckiest day of our lives because everything that could have gone right for us to survive went right. If we had, if it had happened like 30 feet further down the road, it was over this this big ass bridge, and we would have been over water when it flipped yeah. and we would have all drowned. Like yeah. that's, there's no question about that. Uh, literally everything that could have gone right did go right for us to survive. And we, we feel very blessed by whatever kind of power that be or the universe or whatever it is that was helping us that day. Uh, something, something went real right. That's amazing. Yeah. That's so incredible. Yep. Yeah, man, yeah. big time. You got to look at the silver was, linings of, of these kind of things. Yeah, definitely. So it's been six months since then, and I'm sure you've been recovering and all that. Right. And but now you're back. Now we're, we're back. back. We've been yes, uh, sir. we've been working on uh, getting getting fighting fit for playing all of our old songs. Uh, getting ready for this big October twentieth show at the Slide Bar, which is coming up real fast. But other than that, we've also had the chance now to really uh, buckle down and start recording the next album, which we probably wouldn't have because this year was going to be packed full of touring with our friends Joyous Wolf and really getting out there and stuff. But yeah, we're we're really really proud of how this new record's coming along. It's gonna be called "Live Forever," and it almost seems in many of the songs like it's uh, prophetic because a lot of the the con- lyrical content talks about uh, living every moment to its fullest, and uh, that time's the most valuable thing, and yeah. and all these kind of things that are songs that we actually wrote before before the accident happened but have now, added, yeah, now new meaning has now been added a to a whole them. new meaning now a new, a new new definite a new like depth of meaning at least we really we really do look at uh life differently since the accident it's a very uh, oh, yeah. humbling and you know you you can easily just sort of feel like you're indestructible and go through life forever just wasting time pissing on at the v room and getting getting wasted and having a great one but uh when you have something like this happen, you really do start to realize that time is finite. And uh, what do I want out of this life? What do I want? Out, yeah, right. and, and you yeah. got to you got to get it done sooner than later because you never know how much time you're gonna have. Yeah, not only that, but do the things you want to do, not the things people make you to do or change the things people tell tell you that that would pretty much bring you whatever it is that you're looking for. Is just whatever you want to do, do it now. Whatever it is, don't matter if you want to be a fucking baker, be a baker. Yeah, <laughs> whatever it is, I man, just go and do it. Just if you don't do it now. Yeah. You're not going to have it tomorrow. And you're going to regret it later if exactly. you didn't do it. Exactly. You know, I, 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 talk, I, I talk to a lot of musicians, and I always, I always have that conversation with them about when I turned 29, I said, I'm almost going to be 30. I got to get my shit together. Like, shit, shit or get off the pot kind of thing, you know? Mm-hmm. Right. right. And in the last two years, since I'm 30 now, uh, in the last two years, I've just been fucking going all, I've been burning the candle at both ends. Nice. Like, I just like, I'm going to do this or yeah. I'm going to die. Either exactly. Way. exactly. Right. As long as I'm fucking trying. You have to, you have yeah. to. Yeah. And I see so many different bands that like, you know, they put something out maybe, but they don't really like do it right. Follow up. They yeah. don't follow up. Yeah. And I, it's just beautiful to know that there's people out there that work as hard as you guys do. Thanks, man. Thanks, thanks. Yeah. thanks, thanks. Well, yeah. same to you then, I guess. Yeah. Yep. I'm trying. Cheers, yeah. Cheers man. Cheers. You guys want to do a shout out segment? You can shout out anybody you want. Well, we we uh, we shouted out that show that we're doing uh, October twentieth. We've got uh, Lace and Blue, our good our good Long Beach friends, and Bear Wolf are going to both be opening that show up. And then our our dear friends Joyous Wolf, who've been really the best best friends we've ever let's, had. Let's shout as out, musicians. give a shout out to Steve too. Steve's our manager, and he's the guy that's really kind of. I don't know. I won't say held us together, but definitely been a big fucking adhesive for sure. For, the band keeping us like 
During that six months, the six months since the accident, as you can imagine, especially the first three, it was pretty dark. Like yeah. not being able to play at all, anybody, not sure. For a little while, I was like, like, are we gonna keep doing this? I mean, right, I right. think I think we all kind of felt intuitively that we would, but there's still that question mark still overarchingly lies there. Like, yeah. are we gonna do this? Are especially, we gonna get back on the horse? We were in a weird limbo period. Exactly. Yeah, in a limbo right, period. Pretty much. Are we gonna get in a van again and fucking tour the yeah. country yeah, again? Yeah, are yeah, we yeah, gonna right. do that? Are and we like gonna have the kid, balls to get exactly. in the van and do that? And shit so again. Steve, our manager, he's just constantly been a positive, just uplifting. Like, guys, mm. everything's gonna be okay. Don't worry. Like in our corner is just the and a true believer, a true believer in our music above yeah. all else. You know, exactly. there's a lot, a lot of people that are that are in music industry, especially managers and especially record industry executive people that they're really in it for for bottom bottom dollar and and in it for a lot of the wrong reasons. And they back people because they think, oh, this is going to be successful. This girl's hot. Whatever the hell it is. Uh, Steve comes from a much more musical background. He used to work at what was it? Sound Sound City. Sound City. Yeah. Sound City. Yeah. yeah, he used to work at Sound City. So he's, I mean, he he influenced one of uh, Stevie Nicks' songs. Stevie Nicks came in when he was playing the piano one day on on the in the back room, and she's like, "Oh, what's that?" And she started singing over it, and apparently her guitarist came in and caught them jamming together. He kicked a fit because he was all coked up and angry, and then uh, <laughs> and then then Steve had to get out of the room, and then about. Two or three weeks later, Steve hears the demo on the reel, and it's Steve's Steve's riff, but the guitarist had taken it and was playing it on the guitar. <laughs> so Steve, anyway, Steve's a Steve's a real a music man, and that's exactly the the right kind of guy we want behind us. And then we have our other manager, Marty, who's who's just a little raging <coughs> raging bull uh, Irishman, yeah, that Irish just, businessman, just, that just yeah. handles handles exactly business. bulldozers no. people into anything that he wants. Into <laughs> yeah, it's fucking <laughs> no, rad. Yeah. And he, yeah, so to, uh, having having those two behind us has been a, a real real blessing for us. Have you had sure. a lot of experience with uh, music managers that are you know? These are the only two that we've we, ever had. No, we we but, haven't, but uh, in, indirectly through other other friends' bands, uh, we've definitely heard a lot of horror stories about. The kind of guys that I, I definitely don't want to name names here of the kind of guys I'm talking about, but um, the kind of guys that really don't give a f about you, and uh, that are once they once they pass you on and you and you get the deal or whatever, then they wash their hands of you. And when you need you need shit like money to for tour support and all that kind of stuff, they're not there to tell the label where the fuck is the money for these guys. They're struggling right now. All the rest of it, they've they've come and they've gotten their little finders fee and they're out right you know? and wash their that's hands not, that's not mm -hmm. what these guys are steve steve and marty to us are like our our friends slash parents in a in a weird way uh, it's like a, a different overarching couple of fathers that we have <clears throat> that's great man I, I wish everyone had that yeah same yeah yeah um i like to i, I know we already talked about the crash and you know, but I always like to ask about musicians' horror stories. Mm -hmm. So besides the crash, but like, so I like to say like, if you've been to a show where some guy was like really drunk and like they started a fight or, or some crazy thing happened at a show, do you guys have any interesting stories? I got a, I got a funny one. I don't know if this is really a horror story, <laughs> but uh, there's a Long Beach friend of ours. I'm not going to name her name either, but she's awesome. And uh, she's got some big old fake boobies and loves to get them out on stage every now and then. <laughs> okay, now and, I know which story you're talking about. Yeah, and uh, it was one, one night at the Viper Room we were playing and she was nicely sauced up. I think it was on uh, Cinco de Mayo actually, so she was, was. Well, well turned. And uh, she gets up on stage while we're playing, gets the cans out, everybody's loving it, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but then she runs up for a stage dive and everybody cleared the path. Oh, and in this video, you literally hear the Oh, and then, no. oh! <laughs> dude, dude, the, yeah. the thump, the thump of that was like five oh. times the thump of the kick drum. It Seriously, was unreal. It was bad. It was yeah. no, no diss we to your kick we, drum. We, power. we honestly should have fucking. We should have sampled that as the fattest <laughs> kick ever, <laughs> right there. That would have been the next album's kick <laughs> done. But Base. really, really, other than other than uh, than this crash, dude, we've we've been very blessed and not really had any any real negative experiences with playing. Yeah. I mean, not even in your other projects. Other other than the the bullshit stuff like you know when amps blow or yeah. when you forget a fucking chord and you have to do things wrong yeah and, minor stuff and you embarrass but, yourself in this yeah. way that way getting too drunk I've definitely had a few of those so yeah I, like I, minor, I minor fuck ups I don't drink too much before shows now because of that I've I've learned that I can sing in key if I don't drink or I can sing wildly <laughs> right. out of key and think I'm awesome if yeah. I am drunk.
I think it's the case with every fucking band. Yeah, <laughs> I remember seriously. The first time I ever played at the Prospector, Wade gave. Uh, it was the first time I'd moved to Long Beach. I didn't know anybody, and our band got booked at the Prospector, and uh, Wade gave us an open bar. Oh, just shit. Completely, oh shit! Just whatever the fuck you guys want. We got fucking thrashed, and it was mm. like probably the worst performance I've ever had. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> couldn't couldn't play at all. I've always said that I, I. That's the only time I ever wished I was always in a punk band because then I wouldn't have to worry about singing on key. Yeah, mm. just don't give a fuck on stage. Yeah, totally. Um, <laughs> and then, I, and then I always like like to ask the opposite of that. I always like to ask if you guys have any words of inspiration. I know we already kind of went over that a little bit, but like, so you can give practical advice. A lot of people say like always bring an extra guitar or bring an amp or something, or you can give more maybe something more inspirational that you've learned in in your career of doing music that can light a fire under someone's ass. I heard mm. a great one from uh, from our friend Nick of Joyous Wolf a while ago. Um, don't get trapped into making what you think is cool right now because the genres of what's cool for the cool kids right now changes every six months or so so you got to make what's really from you and comes out of you and what you like the most because if you make what is cool at the moment by the time you get a band around you and get it good at actually playing it and build a fucking audience for yourself that little fad will have passed and it also will be a fad because it won't be genuinely what comes out of you find your own voice and find what makes you the happiest to play because that is going to last a lot longer than trying to play what somebody else does yeah you're gonna look a hell of a lot cooler fucking doing something that's genuine than standing up there and obviously doing something that's not authentic so, counterfeating, right. as, counterfeating as we call it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Be i would say just if you're doing something you love continue doing that don't stop. Like it's it doesn't make any sense to stop doing what you love because of outside influence. Fuck that. Like just do what you do. Whether you were successful at it or not, you're not gonna you're not gonna regret that time. You never will. I mean, I could I can attribute to that. I mean, I have I have a fifteen year old daughter. I could easily be like, No, I'm not gonna do this. I'm gonna work my fucking ass off fucking forty, fifty, sixty hours a week for this shit and like no, I'd rather do what I love and give her a positive sort of influence saying, I do what I love because I want to fucking do it. And I want you to do that too, whatever it is. I mean, that's, I don't know, that's kind of what keeps me going. Real. Yeah. And just, yeah. Don't, I would say, I would say, just don't be afraid of failure. Mm -hmm. Use that, even if you do fail, which is inevitable, you just use that as your fuel. Even every, every time I've had a bad night, a bad show, I try to use that to work harder than whatever I messed up. And it's really just like the courage that keeps you going that counts, man. Because people will get discouraged by pretty much failing one night or eating, you know, having a really crappy show and stuff. They go home and like, ah, shit, I don't know if I'm if I'm going to go out there and expose myself like that. It's like, no, go out and do it. Use it as your fuel. Use it as a learning experience rather than a like a put down or a let down. Just use that like you can take something positive from it. So just use failure as a fuel, too, because it's going to happen. There's it's really no way around that. But is really the approach that you can either take that and use it as fuel or you can just let that keep you down totally. or weigh you down. Don't, don't let the fucking doubters tell you no. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. That's the biggest thing. We've got a song called Metal. M-E-T-T-L-E. It's, yeah, it's spelled M-E-T-T-L-E as opposed to M-E-T-A-L, obviously. And M-E-T-T-L-E, the word means it's like a... Fortitude, an inner, inner strength. An inner fortitude, an inner strength despite all circumstances surrounding whatever situation you're in. And... We wrote the song basically about um, when I first moved out here for music, I got so much shit from all these, all my friends in Australia, like, oh, you think you're going to go out to America and make it big time as some fucking rock star or something? They'd always say shit like that. And I put on the, the Australian female fucking hater voice right there for that little segment. <laughs> but it was, it's, it's, it's so real. Like they gave me so much shit Australians about it. have a thing that, uh, I'm not sure if the, the term is uh, common out here, but quite common in Australia, it's called tall poppy syndrome. It's basically when, when one poppy in the field tries to rise above the other poppies, the rest of the poppies cut them down. And do something different. Yeah, they try and cut you down to the same level. And like, for example, I had a friend that was a really good friend that was doing, and he was a dude, and he was doing ballet in high school. And he got so much shit from everybody, even though he was fucking... Touring the country, doing all sorts of crazy performances, getting paid well. But everybody in high school would give him shit. And I, I was like standing there like, 
what the fuck are you all doing? Yeah, you're giving this right. guy, you're giving this guy shit for something that he's really good at, just because what it's different than what you guys like. Because he's not, not following. It's into not the, fucking rugby or, or cricket or, 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 or yeah. That's that's the one thing that's really interesting about sport, Australia. But the only thing that they that Australians will really get behind you for is uh, is being an athlete. Even if you're the, the just got no business trying to play sports at all, you're a little weedy guy. Oh, look at him. Don't give him any shit. He's having a go. He's getting out there. He's yeah, getting amongst if, it. If you try and have a go in some form yeah. of artistic realm, it's suddenly oh, God, this. Yeah. They give you so much shit about it. But you anyway, want to be an actor. You not, want to be not anything. Not to rag on Australia too much. No. The, the point behind that was, yeah, don't let any doubters tell you otherwise about anything. Just fucking do what's you. And I guess that fits in with what Jake first said about the music. Do what's you. Just in right. general. Don't listen to what anybody else says. Just fucking do it. One of my and then make them eat their words afterwards even better. One of my yeah. favorite lines of that that song Luke mentioned that's about that idea of metal is uh, in the pre-chorus. It says, your doubt couldn't quell my flame. It was its fuel. And that's that's the real deal right there. It's like when, when people hate on you and want to shit on you for it, for whatever you're doing, just use it, use it to fuel the flame because God, the satisfaction of uh -huh. proving them wrong is just the most yeah. amazing. We've and we've seen Real. it firsthand with yeah. many of our, our friends back home in Australia when they've come out after after they've been doubters and disbelievers and they come out and they they come to a show or they listen to it or whatever, they're like, Wow, this is actually pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, uh, and they pretend like they were they were in your corner the whole time. It's yeah. like okay. Full sycophant job. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah. No, and that like, that usually means you're doing something right. Oh, exactly. Exactly. That usually right. means you're doing something. And, and when you they tell you the like, pudding, and you never forget, you never forget who was there to start with, you know, and, oh, then, yeah. who, and who hated at the beginning, and who <laughs> believed in you at the beginning. That'll never get forgotten. But hey, you don't you don't hate people for for their doubt or anything. But shit, yeah, it does. It does feel the flame. Feels real nice. Mm -hmm.